You talk about the dangers of replacing nature with genetic engineering. What do you mean by that? Well, we know for years that when you genetically engineer an organism and release it in the environment, we have no way today to recall it. So we have contaminated the genetic gene pool of soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, etc. And we can see that in a hundred years or a thousand years or a million years, as long as that species exists, we may have the out the output, the impact of the genetic engineering that was done in laboratories in the 90s, uh, because it's a self-propagating corruption of the gene pool. Now, we've only gotten about a dozen genetically engineered crops that have been commercialized. And that means that this corruption has happened with those, plus to a smaller extent, those that have been put out for field trials that may have crossed with wild relatives, uh, you know, out of the field trial. But now genetic engineering is so cheap and easy. It costs $169 to get a do-it-yourself kit at Amazon. Um, companies can, if they have a laboratory for the price of dinner, can create a new organism. They're targeting everything with DNA. And there's no real government oversight in most of the world. And the United States has terrible oversight on the gene edited GMOs. They've been convinced that it's safe and predictable, where in fact, the most common result is surprise side effects. So if you imagine for a moment that we release insects and grasses and trees and flowers and livestock, as new organisms that have never, were not the products of the billions of years of evolution, but instead the products of laboratory creations whose number one most common result is surprise side effects, we end up with a situation where we can be replacing ecosystems, replacing nature. Now, when you introduce just one invasive species into an area, we all have the, our favorite examples of an invasive species wreaking havoc. My favorite is rabbits. They introduced 24 rabbits on Christmas Day in, in Australia in 1859 to make visitors from the UK more comfortable so they could hunt rabbits. Well, rabbits multiply like rabbits. And without natural predators, by the 1920s, they estimated over 10 billion rabbits were inhabiting and eating Australia. When you think about genetic engineering, you're not introducing one new organism. You're introducing potentially a replacement of all or many organisms in an ecosystem with unpredicted side effects. So they become like genetic time bombs. And you don't even know what can happen in the next generation if the GMO changes or if it starts to interact with a new, a new other organism or the weather or a disease. And unfortunately, there's no recall. So future generations may not inherit the products of the billions of years of evolution. They may not see nature as it was created, that we inherited. And they may be cursing us for all future generations dealing with the rabbits and the kudzu, but not just that, basically potentially catastrophic, even cataclysmic outcomes of this unpredictable process that's prone to collateral damage and side effects. So we now are looking at the possibility of permanently replacing nature with a self-propagating corrupted gene pool. What's the new responsibility we all have given the new technology of genetic engineering? If we now have the capacity to damage all living beings and all future generations, that's a new capacity. Maybe we haven't had this in the past, except perhaps by blowing everything up with a nuclear winter. But other than that, even, even climate change will have an arc and a, and a, and a restoration period. But with, with species, the only, the only thing that lasts longer than corruption of a gene pool is extinction. So we are looking at 
an impact of this generation that will be felt on this planet forever, as long as the species exists, as long as the ecosystems exist. So then we are invited to take a new, a new role, a new relationship with nature to protect all living beings and all future generations, something that previous generations could never have done because there hadn't been the technology to do such widespread long-term harm. So it requires a, a kind of a expanded understanding of our role with nature and our, our choices today to protect her and to protect future generations. So we can pick our excuse. We can pick the things that we love, whether it's monarch butterflies or, or the microbiome or trees or our children. But it's all part of one ecosystem that we need to protect. And this is the responsibility of this generation right now. It's not 10 years or 20 years, because if we don't stop it, there could be hundreds of thousands of new GMOs introduced in this generation. What's the importance of the microbiome and why is it important to protect it from genetic engineering? You may have been one of the people who were very concerned when we heard about the Chinese scientist in collaboration with US scientists who genetically engineered twins. You know, that's that hits very home to all of us. And there's a there's an ethical, a moral uh, question. You might have been outraged to see pictures of suffering animals that have been genetically engineered that couldn't stand, that were, you know, just horrible pictures of pigs and cows and whatnot. Higher organisms are more connected to our hearts, to our sense of morality. You probably don't suffer much when you think about bacteria being genetically engineered or viruses or fungus, <clears throat> but from a an environmental and even a health standpoint, there's greater risk there. They can absolutely travel around the planet. They can create diseases. They can damage the microbiome of our bodies, of the soil, of the, of the biosphere, of all ecosystems. We know now more than ever before in Western science and Western medicine, that the microbiome is like another organ. <clears throat> it supports our digestion, it supports detoxification, and it supports our immune system. And to such an extent that I remember interviewing Kiran Krishnan, an expert in the microbiome, and he pointed out that about 80% of all diseases have their origin either creating or exacerbating the disease by disturbances in the microbiome. To underscore the point, you can take a sick animal, rat, mouse, take some of its feces and implant it in a healthy rodent and create the disease. You think the disease may be related to something completely different than the gut microbiome you know, of the animal, but it can be transferred. Similarly, you can take the microbiome of a healthy animal and transplant it and create health in a sick animal. And we've done this that we, they've done that with human beings. You can transfer traits like thin or fat or, or relation or how you metabolize sugar. There's, it's all as if programmed. The microbiome are like the, my, the micro Jedi army that works on our behalf and we don't understand it. When a, a, a woman has breast cancer, there's a change in the microbiome in the breast, a new strain comes in and when they kill the strain thinking it was part of the problem, it allowed the tumor to spread. It's actually helping. There's a microbiome that happens in the brain with Alzheimer's. There's the microbiome in the brain that helps intelligence. I was told by Dietrich Klinghart that when you kill off the microbiome in the brain, the intelligence goes down. There's a microbiome change in the, in the birth canal that inoculates the newborn. It's very intelligent. 
it's it's an amazing untapped resource i mean it's tapped in the sense it's constantly available to us but we don't understand it <clears throat> we do know that bacteria can swap genes so you can have one bacteria with a gene and all of a sudden it meets and they have a party and then they all leave with the bacteria that helps them survive we know that it can spread around the planet <clears throat> Now imagine that it's genetically engineered with a trait that you think it's good for the soil, but you don't realize its impact on the gut. Or you think it's good for the gut, but you don't realize its impact in, in the biosphere. It's, it's playing with fire in such a way that we could collapse ecosystems. So our focus at the Institute for Responsible Technology is to protect against the replacement of nature, but we're focusing primarily now <clears throat> on the microbiome.